Hey everyone, this is our last key concept 4.4 and this con key concept focuses on all of the changes that occurred in the 20th century. Demographic, economic, warfare, social, and the effect these changes had on basically everyday life. So the first part of this key concept is very contradictory. On one hand, the 20th century was characterized by large-scale suffering, uh, the warfare of World War I and World War II, the genocide that occurred during the Holocaust, as well as ethnic cleansing and genocides in the 1990s in Europe. And, you know, the, the changes, um, even through today with the Syrian civil war and the amount of refugees coming into Europe. On the other hand, we're also going to see tremendous improvements in the standard of living. Uh, without a doubt, Western Europe in particular is going to be among the highest standard of living of anywhere in the world. And so we see these two contradictory patterns emerge throughout the 20th century. So let's start with a quick review of World War I. Much of this we've already discussed, but as stated earlier, World War I created a lost generation that fostered disillusionment and cynicism. Uh, many of the young that did survive went out and drinking binges um, while brooding in misery. And we're going to see, you know, the literature of the time period and so forth reflect this lost generation. Just to give you an idea of the impact of the war on France, half of all French men between the age of 18 and 30 were killed in the war. Those that did survive were often maimed. And it, it was this cynicism, this, you know, change from this European supremacy that is going to contribute to this lost generation. In addition, however, World War I is also going to transform the lives of women. In many respects, World War I was a turning point in the lives of women. Afterwards, in countries such as uh, Britain and Germany and the Soviet Union, women will get the right to vote. After World War II, they'll get the right to vote in uh, France and Italy. We'll see improved conditions as well, which we'll talk about later on. And then finally, it also led to the democratization of peoples, especially those in Western Europe. As democracies develop in Western Europe um, through continue to develop through 19 after the Second World War, and then after the end of the Cold War, we we'll see democracies develop even in Eastern Europe. As far as our review of World War II, keep in mind that World War II from 1939 to 1945 decimated a generation of Russian and German men. Uh, Russian uh, losses in the war were about 22 million. Uh, as well, and the Holocaust resulted, you know, in the virtual destruction of European Jewry. Six of the nine million Jews in Europe were killed during the Holocaust, and many of the survivors uh, went to Israel or had a harder time going back to their former lives. Many came to the United States as, as well. In addition, there was the murder of millions of other groups by the Nazis. Uh, just a quick review, uh, the, the, the Roma, or known as the Gypsies, uh, homosexuals, people with disabilities, um, and that combined with uh, forced large-scale migrations both during and after the war is going to play an even greater part in, in the losses. Millions were left homeless and millions were relocated, you know, after the war. And, you know, these forced migrations are going to just add to the misery in Europe. And finally, we're also going to see undermining of the pre- war class hierarchies. And the fact that after the war, we're actually seeing really the ascendancy of the middle class. We're going to see more working class develop into a middle class. And so the, you know, despite these horrors, we are going to see standard of living, you know, mass production, new food technologies, industrial efficiency, increased disposable income and created a consumer culture in which greater domestic comforts, such as electricity and indoor plumbing, became available. And so with this consumer culture that develops, once again, go back to the Marshall Plan, go back to the West, uh, Western European economic miracle. The fact that the nations were forced to cooperate helped to develop this. And the rise of the new middle class was largely the result, not only of the Marshall Plan and the economics, but also of increased access to high, higher education. The new middle class was more highly skilled. They were more educated. They were more democratic. And, you know, these, these changes were very influential towards a less rigid class structure. And there are multiple reasons for the rise of the new middle class. The rapid industrial and technological expansion created 
demand a larger number of scientists and man managers. Um, a lot of the old property classes lost control of many family-owned businesses during the Second World War and afterwards. And, you know, many, many of these top-ranking managers and civil servants, um, you know, were well-paid, they were highly trained, and they passed on the opportunity for advanced education to their children. In addition, the structure of lower classes became more flexible and open. Millions of rural workers continued to move to the cities. Uh, the industrial working class really you know, ceased to expand while job opportunity for white collar and service employees grew rapidly. And we talked earlier about you know, European governments reduced class tensions by further expanding the welfare state. Healthcare, maternity grants, public housing you know, were the norm. And so this consumerism worked to level Western society. You know, um, the what we're going to see are new communication and transportation technology. We're going to see a gadget revolution. For example, in the 50s and 60s, Europeans are going to buy washing machines, vacuum cleaners, refrigerators, dishwashers, radios, TV, stereos. And if you want to use a synthesis point in one of your essays, this was also going on across the pond in the United States during the 1950s and early 60s. You know, um, furthermore, you know, leisure and recreation became major industries as workers worked fewer hours. Soccer matches, movies, TV, you know, all became increasingly important. There were increased attendance in concerts and exhibitions. And the most dramatic expansion was that in the travel industry. Before World War II, travel for pleasure and relaxation was largely for the upper middle classes. Paid vacations, however, as a part of the welfare state were required by law and led to more increased travel throughout the continent. In addition, some of the new technologies that you know multiplied the connections across space and time and transformed daily life included the telephone, uh, which bound people closer together. Radio played a role in entertaining the masses um, in the early part of the century. And by the second part of the century, television became the dominant communications technology. The number of hours people spent watching TV grew significantly through the late 20th century. And you know, the one, the personal computer developed, you know, became another staple in European homes and played an enormous role in business. The introduction of the internet, the cell phone, further revolutionized communication and facilitated globalization. We're also going to see, you know, once again, I want to get a little more detail about the influence of the movies. Uh, moving pictures were first shown as a novelty in like naughty peep shows and the penny arcades in the 1890s, especially in Paris. And by the early 1920s through the age of the silent film, the, the silver screen, Charlie Chaplin was one of the more important ones. And then in 1927, with the advent of talkies, we're gonna see you know, national film industry, industries really revive, especially in France and especially in the totalitarian states. Motion pictures became the main entertainment of the masses until well after World War II. And like radio, they became very powerful tools of indoctrination, like I said earlier, especially in those totalitarian states. Lenin encouraged development of Soviet filmmaking, leading to epic films in the mid-20s, the most famous directed by Sergei Eisenstein, who dra dramatized the communist views of Russian history. In Germany, Lenny Riefenstahl directed the documentary Propaganda, The Triumph of the Will, based on the Nazi Party rally at Nuremberg in 1934. In addition, the radio was used uh, as well during this time period, and it was actually used for military purposes during World War I, but after 1920, public broadcasts were used. You know, um, radio was an effective tool for propaganda during the dictatorial regimes, regimes, and we'll see television begin to take that role in the 1950s and 1960s. The lives of women were also defined by family and work, uh, responsibilities and economic changes in feminism. And so a little quick review, early women's rights advocates, Olympe de Gouges and Mary Wollstonecraft during the French Revolution, demanded equality for women based on the Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen. But by the late 19th century, women in continental Europe agitated for increased property rights, um, agitated for liberalized divorce laws and increased business. We're also going to see in the late 19th and early 20th century, the rise of the suffragettes in Britain, led by Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters, and women played significant roles in society during the First World War and even the Second World War. Uh, they had to work, they had to run the farm, something we'd already talked about. And so during the World Wars, you know, like I said, we're going to see a significant change after the wars. Um, you know, the years after World War I, 
we're going to see the age of the flapper. We're going to see women as more independent. So they already had received the right to vote in a few countries prior to World War I, and then after World War I, Britain, Germany, and the Soviet Union. Uh, do keep in mind, if you're writing an essay about women, the difference between Britain and Germany versus Italy and Nazi Germany, where women were relegated to the home and were expected to you know, bear uh, children for the regime. Uh, another good piece of synthesis, compare that with the idea of the Republican motherhood during the American Revolution, for those of you who have taken US history. Um, we're also going to see, like I said, reforms in women in both Eastern and Western Europe. So Eastern Europe, we've already talked about the ideas in the Soviet Union, uh, where women generally gain uh, more uh, increased rights in the workplace, uh, more equal, closer to equal pay. Um, the whole spirit of egalitarianism within the communist regimes did help that. However, do keep in mind women kept the traditional roles at home as a homemaker, mother, and took taking care of the children as well as the uh, others within the household. In Western Europe, we'll also see reforms. Like I said, after the Nazi era and the post-war era, women continued to marry earlier. Western European culture once again emphasized the cult of domesticity in the 1950s and that women should stay in the home. And we're actually going to see, you know, during this time, the typical woman in Europe, you know, had children quickly after marrying and averaged, you know, more than two children per family. Uh, but what we're also going to see after World War II is rising employment of married women. Uh, this becomes a powerful force in drive for women's equality and emancipation. Uh, and the idea, um, the, the sharp increase uh, in married women who became full-time and part-time wage earners is going to greatly change that. Keep in mind, if you're writing uh, an essay about women during this time period, part of the uh, importance you can bring into the essay would be uh, Betty Friedan's The Feminine Mystique, despite the fact that that was in the United States. And that kind of led credence to say that not all women wanted to stay at home and be mothers, uh, that some women wanted a career. But also keep in mind, this is European history, not US history, and you need to give a European example. And so I would say the best European example to give is Simone de Beauvoir, who wrote The Second Sex. And this is going to kind of inspire the second wave feminist movement of the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, 70s. Uh, she herself was a French existentialist, and she argued that women were in essence free, but had almost always been trapped by inflexible and limiting conditions. And only by courageous action and self-assertive creativity could women become free and escape the role as the inferior other. Um, this, combined with Frieden's work in the feminine mystique, are going to uh, you know, increase women's rights. We will also see during this time period child care facilities uh, grow dramatically. That was also part of the welfare state in Europe. We'll see the, and despite this, we're still going to see the baby boom occurring where, you know, more and more children are being born. And new modes of marriage, partnership, motherhood, divorce, and reproduction are going to give women more options in their personal lives. You know, for example, starting in the 1960s, the invention of the birth control pill, uh, couples did not always marry. Uh, the sexual revolution changed the sexual mor uh, morals of society. And even, you know, it became acceptable to have children and not be married, which tradition, you know, weaken the traditional role marriage played. Furthermore, the divorce rate increased substantially starting in the 1960s, resulting in broken families. Um, the sexual revolution and better antibiotics also led to what we call consequence-free sex. STDs could be treated. Uh, this will be a, a trend that will end in the 1980s with the advent of HIV and AIDS. And, you know, we're also going to see as a result of the birth control pill, women are, we're going to see the end of the baby boom. Uh, women had new options to get pregnant and the birth rate is going to drop in Western and Central Europe below 2.0 children per family. And finally, we're going to see women attain high political offices and increase their representation in legislative bodies in many nations. Margaret Thatcher is going to become the United Kingdom's prime minister from 1979 through 1990. And uh, Angela Merkel has served as Germany's chancellor since 1905. Theresa May just recently became uh, the UK's prime minister once again. And overall, women are going to, the roles are going to change vastly for women during the 20th century. In addition to this, we're going to see other voices gain prominence in political, intellectual, and social discourse. 
Green parties in Western and Central Europe were leftist groups who favored environmentalism, social justice, and nonviolence. And the first Green Party was organized in Britain in 1973, but enjoyed national prominence really in Germany during the 1980s as it opposed nuclear power. It became Europe's largest environmental party and has been the vanguard of cleaning up pollution ever since. Um, and it has served in several coalitions in Germany, even with the Social Democrats. Uh, the Finnish Green Party became the first to be a part of a national cabinet, and Green parties played influential roles also in Belgium, France, Ireland, and the Netherlands. Today, it is the fourth largest party in the European Parliament. The counterculture of the 1960s embraced homosexuality, and as a result, we're going to see gay and lesbian movements form. By 2011, the Netherlands are going to recognize same-sex marriage, and nine other Western European countries are going to follow suit, including France in 2013. It's interesting to note the difference between Western and Eastern Europe. Eastern European countries are much slower in recognizing same-sex relationships, um, less enthusiastic concerning gay rights, and some very seriously increased discrimination, particularly in, the Rus in Russia. We're also going to see intellectual and youth reactions. And in the 1960s, we're going to see you know, the beginnings of this counterculture movement, this rebellion against authority. Much of this was actually caused by the prosperity of the middle classes and the fact that, you know, several really weren't sure what to do with themselves. Um, there was, you know, student discontent. They're worried about their future. Rock music and drugs encouraged this. Uh, Bob Dylan best expressed, you know, radical politics in the songs. The Beatles, the Kinks and other bands added the movement's popularity. Combine that with the sexual revolution as well and the opposition of the established orders, you know, feelings of generational conflict. There was kind of the rebirth of the idea that, you know, that despite the prosperity and the affluence in the West, that, you know, the West was rotten. And this was all compounded by the fact of the Vietnam War, which was viewed as immoral, not just in the, by protesters in the United States, but protesters and counterculture movements throughout Western Europe. And many of the younger generation claiming that increasing materialism was harmful and that post-war society was repressive and flawed like I said, despite their gains, despite the fact that more were educated in college, despite the fact, you know, that more were prosperous and could afford college. However, what we're going to see is because of this increased education, we're going to see overcrowding in college. And many had doubts about this future. And many felt that they were victims of an impersonal bureaucracy amongst college staff. And we're going to see a general student strike in 1968, which is going to spread to workers. At one point, de Gaulle was forced to move troops to Paris and call for new elections. And overall, even though the revolts were put down, it's going to, they're going to show this basic disillusionment with materialism, with technology, and especially with the Vietnam War. And finally, we're also going to see a revival of nationalism, a theme we've been talking about uh, forever. And I would very much encourage you to go over nationalism and kind of look at the theme from the 19th and 20th centuries. This would be a great continuity and change question. Um, it would really be great for a DBQ, but going into the uh, late 20th century, we can look at nationalism. Like, for example, the unification of Germany uh, changed the face of European politics. Germany was now an even greater powerhouse. However, a lot of the East Germans or Aussies came to feel like second class citizens in the face of economic dis uh, difficulties. Uh, meanwhile, the Wessies resented years of heavy taxation to rebuild the East. And we're going to see a rising xenophobia in Germany, um, especially by the Aussies against some of the guest workers who had been largely uh, Islamic and Turkish during this time period that continued to monopolize some of these jobs that many from the socialist East German state felt should be theirs. We're also going to see a little bit of um, nationalism in Britain. Britain was the last to really, not the last, it was the last major power to join the EU. Um, but even though it joined, it didn't take part in the European Monetary Union. It didn't accept the euro as its currency. And just recently with the vote of the Brexit to go out of the EU, you know, we see, you know, continued nationalism in Britain. Uh, part of that was due to some of the EU's, um, I don't want to say restrictions, EU's regulations regarding uh, migrants and refugees. Uh, the French had been nationalistic going back to the De Gaulle time period in the 60s. And at one point, you know, the French withdrew their troops from NATO's command due to fears of American dominance in European politics and due to Britain's close relationship to the U.S. One of the reasons Britain was denied entrance to the EU early on was because of this special relationship they had with the U.S. And it was the French who um, would not allow them to enter. 
And finally, like I said earlier, the, the rising xenophobia, anti-immigrant actions, um, the guest workers became a major source of tension among right-wing nationalists, not just the Turkish immigrants in Germany and Austria, but North African immigrants in France, uh, immigrants from Asia that were in Britain. And we are going to see um, several right-wing parties that are going to grow. In France, Jean-Marie Jean -Marie Le Pen was the most outspoken opponent of both immigration and French integration to the European Union. His daughter, Marine Le Pen, just recently came in second place in, in the runoff in the French elections uh, that she did not win. But it shows this growing um, nationalism that is developing within France and this growing anti-immigrant agitation. Uh, furthermore, in Austria in the 1990s, George Heider, or early 2000s, led the right-wing Austrian Freedom Party, also staunchly opposed to immigration. And, you know, at one point, you know, his party was the ruling coalition government by 2000, the EU actually demanded that he step down. And after the 9-11 tax in the US and the 2004 train bombing in Madrid, we're gonna see increasing anti-Muslim immigrant sentiment going on throughout Europe. And by January 1915, the Charlie Hebdo attacks in France by a faction of Al Qaeda further illustrated the cultural conflict between Islam and secular society. 12 died, 11 were wounded. The November Paris attacks by ISIL in 2015 also left 130 dead and 368 injured. A three month state of emergency in France ensued and continued attacks have been, have not been the exception and we should continue in uh, agitation as, like I said, evidenced in the ballot box in France. As far as the future um, with refugees and immigration, it's, it's, we just don't know. Uh, we'll watch and see what goes on. And finally, I just want to tell everyone good luck on the exam. Uh, remember, uh, answer questions thoroughly, think them through, don't spend too much time, and hopefully you'll do well.